In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced the accession of six countries in January 24 to the BRICS alliance. In Japan, authorities began dumping contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean despite numerous protests and environmental concerns. And in the United Nations Office, and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has called for the regulation of exemptions to the sanctions against Niger so that the humanitarian aid required by the country is not affected. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Andalusia Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. On Thursday, South African President Sir Ramaphosa announced the expansion of the BRICS group starting in January 2024 with the accession of six countries. With the entry of Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, BRICS will comprise 46% of the world's population and 39% of the world's gross domestic product. Chinese President Xi Jinping described the expansion of the alliance as historic and affirmed that it will give the mechanism greater equality. In his speech, Brazilian President Lula Silva assured that this will not be the only accessions and recalled that the group already has a mechanism for membership. The heads of state of Russia and India, by reporting and Narendra Modi, shared the hope of working to further expand the influence of BRICS. In this context, President Lula Silva, on behalf of his country, joined in the welcome to the new members of the bloc. Among the various results of today's summit, we highlight the expansion of the BRICS with the inclusion of new members, as was indicated by President Ramaphosa. It is with satisfaction that Brazil welcomes Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Ethiopia, and Iran to the BRICS. World leaders participated on Thursday in the BRICS Plus talks with its focus on the bloc's goals of cooperation towards a multipolar and just world. The Argentine president, Alberto Fernandez, highlighted the relevance of Argentina's membership in the geopolitical system. We want to and want to be part of the BRICS because the difficult dual contest gives the bloc a singular relevance that makes it an important geopolitical and financial reference, although not the only one for this developing world. Being part of the BRICS strengthens us and does not exclude other instincts of integration and even less so the proud membership of Argentina in the multilateral system of the United Nations. The president of Bolivia, Luis Arce, during his speech at the BRICS summit called for solidarity and mutual cooperation among the countries of the South to solve the problems they face. The problem in the south of the world are not going to be solved by the north. Neither the uh, exploitation of the resources of these countries. The problems of the countries of the south have to solve them by ourselves. With solidarity and mutual cooperation. Therefore, the expansion of the BRICS group is so important because it allows uh, nations worldwide to, accede, uh, to have access to an uh, international market. Bolivian President Luis Alce highlighted the economic impact of BRICS in a world seeking multipolarity for the Bolivian mandate, a production and industrialization is must respect Mother Earth. The BRICS are um, the BRICS are um, gaining uh, economical uh, development in the international world. They are cooperating to uh, succeed economically, always respecting the environment and taking into account the economical crisis crisis that is. Uh, underway in the world. They have uh, accomplished uh, many things such as uh, being able to uh, diminish the number of poverty in these countries.
they have been able to uh, overcome economical crisis and to develop economically. These economical advances allow us to, uh, to ad advance in our journey to be a fully developed country. For his part, President Nicolas Maduro sent a message from the people of Venezuela to the 15th BRICS summit where he emphasized that his nation joins countries aspiring to join the alliance. Venezuela joins the aspirations of countries seeking to join the BRICS. We officially expressed this in a letter in 2015, and we recently reaffirmed it. We are willing to contribute to this global integrated model with the richest oil reserves, certified oil reserves. They are in our country. Furthermore, our nation possesses abundant mineral resources, accounting for over 20% of global reserves of iron, copper, and gold, as well as deposits of silver, bauxite, coltan, nickel, rhodium, titanium, among others. The Venezuelan leader also stated that his government proposes the integration of the BRICS bloc with Latin America and the Caribbean integration mechanisms. We undertake the responsibility of promoting political and economic relations between the BRICS architecture and the key mechanisms of consultation and cooperation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Among these, I am talking about the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, the People's Trade Treaty, this is ALBA TCP, and the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC, aiming to advance the formation of regional blocs as was envisaged in the historic summit 2014 between BRICS and UNASUR. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro also proposed to revitalize the alliance between Latin American multimedia, Telesur, and TV BRICS as a way of strengthening cooperation in communication. The consolidation of these ambitious alliances requires a high level of people's awareness about realities, strengths, and capacities for united progress. To that end, we propose strengthening the communicational alliance by revitalizing cooperation between the BRICS and Telesur and the Latin American Caribbean multimedia and multi-state platform. Let's now take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, in subjects, and much more. All the stories coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back from the South. The plenary of the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies approved on Thursday a provisional project to fix the increase of the minimum wage retroactive from last May. With a total of 439 votes in favor and one against, the bill will be sent to the Senate for approval and will then have to be promulgated by President Lula da Silva. The proposal approved by the Chamber establishes that people who earn up to two minimum wages do not need to present an income tax return. In this sense, the deputies also approved the calculation of the minimum wage for the year 2024 and the following periods. In the United States, Donald Trump's former lawyer and also former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, turned himself into the Georgia authorities and denounced the process as a, force, as a farce against him. Giuliani, who was Donald Trump's personal attorney during his presidency, was booked into the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, charged with attempting to alter the outcome of the 2020 election in the southern state. Minutes later, he was released on a $150,000 U.S. dollar bail. As part of this process, Donald Trump and 18 other co-defendants will face charges of racketeering and conspiracy this Thursday. The court gave them until noon on Friday to surrender to the authorities.
In the Dominican Republic, Storm Franklin left at least one person dead and another missing. The civil defense report that the victim was identified as Carlos Marino Martinez, who lost his life in the city of San Cristobal when he was swept away by the floods. Although the storm began to move away from, from the Dominican territory, authorities have asked the population to remain in their homes or in shelters. The strong floods also affected more than 300 people and a 54-year-old citizen is missing. Tropic of storm also caused power outages in different regions. On Wednesday, Greek firefighters struggled to contain uncontrolled fires throughout the con country for a fifth day, several of them bordering an accurate smoke field, Athens. In the last two days, 19 people believed to be migrants, including two children, have been killed in forest fires. A fire fanned by strong winds raped through the foothills of Mount Parnitha, the largest forest adjoining the capital burning near the outskirts of a national park and threatening a casino in the area. Evacuations were ordered on Wednesday morning for several settlements in the area, including three nursing homes. The blaze damaged homes in the northwestern Athens district of Menidi, which is also close to a military camp. Nikos Contro Michalis, a Hellenic Red Cross organizer, told State TV ERT in Menidi that many people don't want to leave their homes. As Europe and other regions sweltering, a UN researcher cautioned that climate change was undoubtedly an increasingly intense and long-lasting heat wave, which in some areas could soon begin to hit year-round. Extreme heat has dominated the headlines in recent weeks, from the Korean heat dome cooking much of Europe to heat-filled wildfires raging in Greece, Spain, Canada and Hawaii, and soaring temperatures in the middle of the South African winter. John Nairn, a senior extreme heat advisor at the UN World Organization, told AFP in an interview that heat waves are beginning earlier, lasting longer, and becoming more intense. He also said that it is the most rapidly emerging consequence of global warming that we are seeing in the weather systems, stressing that this was in line with scientific predictions. He also lamented that people are far too relaxed about the science. Moreover, he added that science has been saying that this is coming, and if this is not where it stops, it will only get more intense and more frequent. In Japan, despite numerous protests, authorities began dumping contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean, a process that will continue for decades with the approval of the International Atomic Energy Agency. More than 1 million tons of purified radioactive water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is being released by Japan into the Pacific. The operation was approved two years ago by the Japanese government, which got the go-ahead from the United Nations Agency, the IAEA. The plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power, started the discharge at 1 p.m. local time after activating the pump at the site. This first release, some 7,800 tons, is expected to take about 17 days. The government of China on Thursday rejected the dumping of contaminated wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan into the Pacific Ocean. The Chinese foreign ministry urged the Japanese government to halt the move while stating that the disposal of nuclear contaminated water is a nuclear safety issue. Beijing added that the Japanese government failed to demonstrate that the discharge into the ocean is safe and harmless to the marine environment and human health, as well as the effectiveness of the monitoring plan. In response to this situation, the Chinese authorities announced the suspension of imports of all aquatic products from Japan to avoid risks due to the discharge of contaminated water into the ocean. According to the General Administration of Customs, the measures include the suspension of edible marine animals from entering the country. The Chinese Foreign Ministry also described these actions as an extremely selfish and irresponsible act with disregard the global public interest. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate your notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. If you a short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. 
The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has called for the regulation of exemptions to the sanctions against Niger so that the humanitarian aid required by the country is not affected. The organization has denounced that important quantities of urgent medical supplies, nutritious food, equipment and food reserve are paralyzed in neighboring countries due to air and border closures, in addition to other contingencies generated as a result of the decisions of the Economic Community of West African States and the African Union in response to the seizure of power by the so-called National Council for the Safeguarding of the Homeland since July 26. On Wednesday, for the fourth straight day, Sudanese paramilitaries fought the regular army in Khartoum for control of a key armored corps base in the capital south. According to local authorities, fighters from Mohammed Hamdan Taklo's rapid support forces began their assault on the vast strategic compound on several fronts on Sunday. Residents of Al Shahara, the neighborhood where the base is located, reported large losses on both sides on the first day of the attack when the fighting was constant. The war between the rival generals and former allies erupted on April 15th, and conservative estimates from the armed conflict location and event data project are that nearly 5,000 people have been killed since then. According to United Nations figures, in the four months since the fighting broke out, more than 4.6 million people have had to flee their homes. Also in Sudan, the non-governmental organization Save the Children informed that about 500 children have died from hunger in Sudan since fighting erupted. According to the organization, at least 31,000 children lack access to treatment for malnutrition and related illnesses since the charity was forced to close 57 of its nutrition centers in the country. <laughs> With the refugees situation, mothers struggle to feed their children, so we now receive many cases of malnutrition. We need prevention measures for malnutrition cases, as it will help in dealing with many cases that we receive upon their arrival. In addition to this, any malnutrition patient who comes to us should receive proper medications, and we don't have any medications here. We received many malnutrition and malaria cases. Our message to raise awareness regarding malnutrition cases within the camp community is to report the case to the nearest medical center once symptoms appear in a child in order to receive proper treatment. Zimbabwe's electoral authorities have extended the deadline for voting in some areas affected by logistical problems until Thursday. President Emerson Nangagwa issued the order in a bid to give citizens more time to exercise their right to vote because polling, material, ex polling materials arrived late and as a result, polling stations did not open at the scheduled time. The president assured that the extension will not affect the general schedule of data collection, so the order remains in place for the results of the elections to be released within five days. We have come to the end of this news program. You can find these and many other stories on our website, telesolenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesol English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.